Good afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's Directors Forum. Our speaker is Her Excellency Aratu Kazaku Markolis, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Cyprus. Uh, Madam Minister, welcome back to Washington. Uh, I'm Mike Van Dusen, Executive Vice President of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and um, I'm delighted to host uh, this opportunity to listen to Minister uh, Kazaku uh, Markolis. Uh, her talk today is entitled, uh, Cyprus and the Eastern Mediterranean, Strategic Location, Strategic Opportunities. Um, she will give uh, the Republic of Cyprus his perspective on the complex history and exciting recent developments in the e Eastern Mediterranean region. The Arab Spring, Turkey's role as a rising economic power, the ongoing turmoil in nearby Syria, the Euro crisis, and the discovery of fossil fuel deposits in Cyprus, all have put this important divided island nation in the middle of the shifting geopolitical landscape of that area. In the second half of 2012, Cyprus will take over the EU's rotating presidency for the first time. Dr. Kozaku Markolis uh, will also offer her thoughts about the status of efforts to move forward in UN-backed negotiations for a settlement of the Cyprus dispute, as well as her country's view of other developments throughout the Eastern Mediterranean region. Dr. Kozaku Markolis uh, was appointed foreign minister last August for the second time, having served in that position previously for close to a year. Uh, she has had a distinguished diplomatic career, having served as ambassador to the United States and Sweden, and in both cases carried additional responsibilities through concurrent accreditation to other countries and to international institutions. Before her current appointment as foreign minister, she was uh, the Minister of Communications and Works, where she was the head of the Working Group on Property in the UN-sponsored uh, negotiations between Greek and Turkish Cypriot communities, which have been held since 2008. As you know, the Woodrow Wilson Center is the National Living Memorial honoring uh, the, pre uh, the United States' 28th president. This is a center provides an essential link uh, between the world of ideas and the world of pub public policy. We offer a nonpartisan setting for research and dialogue on topics of national and international significance. Created by an act of Congress in 1968, um, the Wilson Center is supported by both public and private funds. Dr. Kozaku Markolis exemplifies a Wilsonian tradition of bringing knowledge to the public service through her notable academic career a graduate of the University of Athens with a degree in law, and uh, she continued to study public, pol uh, public law and political science in her graduate study there. Later, she studied sociology and political science at the University of Helsinki, where she got her doctorate. Please join me in welcoming the Foreign Minister of Cyprus. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it is uh, a great pleasure uh, for me to be with you today at uh, this prestigious center where I have uh, been graciously hosted before during my tenure as uh, ambassador of my country over a decade ago. I have indeed wonderful memories from that period and uh, I cherish many friendships and uh, very strong bonds with institutions like the Woodrow Wilson Center, but also many individuals, many of whom are here today. I would like to thank uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center for inviting me to speak uh, and for giving me the opportunity to share with you my thoughts and my vision for my country and uh, for our neighborhood, the Eastern Mediterranean. I chose to speak on a topic which uh, preoccupies much of the media academics and political analysts in our part of the world, but also in this country. The topic is Cyprus in the Eastern Mediterranean, strategic location, 
strategic opportunities. When Cypriots uh, talk about politics, one often gets the feeling that they strongly hold that Cyprus is the center of the earth, or maybe also the universe. <laughs> Though definitely not true, hidden behind such an outlook is a trace of price, pride uh, behind such uh, an outlook, uh, which carries with it thousands of years of history and uh, civilization. To be absolutely honest, uh, I truly share this pride, simply by looking at a map of Europe, Asia, and Africa, one can clearly witness that Cyprus lies in an area of the world where influences from East and West have met and major historic events have taken place over the centuries, that it sits on a crossroad. And it is not a cliche to describe the location of Cyprus as a crossroad and of considerable strategic importance. Throughout history, and uh, still today, for anyone traveling north to Europe, south to Africa, east to Asia, or westward, all cross through the crossroad on which Cyprus sits. As much as this crossroad is a geographic location, it is even more so a historical junction. Indeed, Considering that human settlement in Cyprus dates back nine millennia BC, one can only imagine and then spend probably a lifetime appreciating the historical footprint that Cyprus carries, the accumulation of cultures, religions, languages, traditions, and ideas that have come to pass through our land. Cyprus, the easternmost island in the Mediterranean Sea, positioned at the crossroads of three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa, has been a junction of the world's great civilizations. From its 11,000 years of history, Cyprus has woven its own distinctive history and culture. From a political strategic point of view, it is also easy to appreciate that almost all, and I mean it, all major powers that have ruled uh, that region at any time in history have passed near, over, or on Cyprus and conquered or controlled the island in one way or another. Cypriots have experienced this on their flesh, on their soil, and on their souls. We have been raided, owned, and sold. We have been ruled and occupied. Our copper mines, our forests, our grain, and our salt exploited and traded by our conquerors. Our antiquities ravaged and pilfered, our heritage plundered, and yet we have persevered with the resilience that perhaps can be best characterized as stubbornness, committed to our land, or simply bound and deeply rooted to it. However, the story of Cyprus is ultimately not a sad one, but one which should give hope to humanity because our achievements have been substantial. Since independence in 1960, we have managed to emerge from colonial rule and succeeded as few other former colonies have. Even after being ravaged by the Turkish invasion in 1974, torn by the subsequent occupation, economically destroyed as a result of both, we have rebuilt, thrived, 
and forged ahead. We have built a stable functioning democracy. We have cherished a free, liberal society. We have welcomed foreigners. We have adapted to change and embraced technology. We have become a full member of the European Union and the Eurozone and are actively contributing to their evolution and functioning. As a member of the United Nations, we have steadfastly held onto positions of principle, insisting on the application and primacy of international law in the conduct of nations based on the UN Charter. Indeed, we have been a responsible international actor, a small actor, but in a neighborhood like the tumultuous region of the Middle East and the East Mediterranean, we have been an island of stability. Moreover, we have sustained and nurtured very good relations with all our neighbors, at least those willing to have relations with us. And our neighbors have come to know us as a reliable and constructive partner. Our policy is to, a broad, uh, is to broaden these relationships, contribute to the stability and prosperity of our neighbors as if it was our own. And as a member of uh, the European Union, the farthest member to the east and to the south, we intend to contribute to promoting and injecting the policies of the Union in our southern neighborhood and to, ser and to serving as a conduit for our neighbors in Brussels and among our eastern partners. Cyprus is now at a crossroads of its own. It is at a historical moment that uh, is both full of opportunities and challenges, but also one of threats and possible perils. Definitely not of our own doing. This means that Cyprus will have uh, to take momentous decisions and take bold steps forward of strategic importance. It will have to engage its neighbors and its friends, but also find a way to communicate effectively with its neighbor to the north, that is Turkey. It is important to state here without hesitation Developments in Cyprus will have an effect on its neighborhood. This has historically been the case, but this time Cyprus is in an unusual position of having greater say in its future and being in a position to effect change. Indeed, a number of important factors appear to be coming together, and if this confluence this convergence of interest is harnessed properly and wisely. The opportunities for Cyprus, its partners, and uh, its neighbors can have enormous positive effects. The first major development uh, of which I'm sure you are all aware is the start of uh, drilling operations by the Republic of Cyprus uh, licensed U.S. company Noble Energy within our exclusive economic zone in search of natural gas deposits. Initial findings have uh, already shown positive results ranging from 3 to 9 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and uh, we are expecting within the next few days, in fact, official estimate estimates. Noble Energy has been operating in the Mediterranean Sea offshore Israel since 1998. They have a 47% interest in the Marie B field, the first offshore natural gas production facility in Israel. Sib significant new exploration discoveries at Tamar, Talit, and Leviathan will help meet Israel's energy needs and drive new potential for natural gas in the years to come. Tamar was the largest deep water natural gas discovery in the world in 2009, 
with gross mean resources of 9 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Leviathan represents the largest exploration success in noble energy's history with gross median uh, mean resources of 16 or 18, as it was recently uh, estimated, uh, uh, trillion cubic feet of natural gas. The US uh, Geological Society uh, survey estimated a mean of 1.7 billion barrels of recoverable oil and a mean of uh, 122 trillion cubic feet of recoverable gas in the Levant Basin province, as well as uh, 1.8 billion barrels of recoverable oil, 223 trillion cubic feet of recoverable gas, and 6 billion barrels of natural gas liquids in the Nile Delta Basin province in the Eastern Mediterranean. These developments uh, in the discovery of hydrocarbon reservoirs are significant for a number of, uh, on a number of levels. First, uh, and uh, I think this is obvious, the positive results of the drilling in Israel and the preliminary results in Cyprus prove beyond doubt that the geological surveys and estimates on the presence of uh, large quantities of hydrocarbons in the Levant Basin, but also in the area south of Cyprus have merit. From uh, an economic point of view, the significance is uh, great. At an early stage, this will imply greater interest by other international companies for the second round of bidding to gain licenses for exploratory drilling in other parts of the Cypriot exclusive economic zone. At the same time, this will also serve as a catalyst for financial investments in Cyprus. Second, once natural gas and uh, possibly also oil are found in quantities and in qualities uh, that justifies further investments, this will lead to job creation. This will not only happen in Cyprus, but will also involve directly the economies of our neighbors. Moreover, the investment that will be required on, uh, in infrastructure, maintenance, support services, financing, and banking, all these suggest uh, that uh, the job creation will be long-term. This would be a positive and stabilizing development for the whole region. Third, it is likely that the momentum that will be created by the sort of investment in infrastructure and uh, financial structures for the servicing of the energy industry will serve as a catalyst towards greater cooperation among neighbors. The Eastern Mediterranean is a crowded and most tormented place, and there is uh, a structural interrelation, not only in the geological topography of the seafloor, but also in the sensitive balances which exist uh, on the political level. The possibility of joint exploitation between the countries of the Eastern Mediterranean and the launching of joint projects, particularly in areas where the natural gas or petroleum fields fall across the line separati separating exclusive economic zones, not only does exist, but we are promoting this cooperation through framework agreements. We are currently negotiating with Israel, Egypt, and Lebanon concerning the joint development and exploitation of cross median line hydrocarbons reservoirs. In any case, we are of the opinion that uh, when evidence becomes uh, more concrete as uh, to the benefits uh, that could be had, this kind of cooperation will become not only obvious, but an indispensable tool that has the potential to change the whole political and economic scene of the entire area. Finally, on the subject of uh, hydrocarbon resources in the Eastern Mediterranean, 
we believe that it will contribute towards greater energy security in Europe, a continent that is on the constant lookout for new sources of energy. As a member state of the European Union, we have a stake in its success. We believe that potential deposits of hydrocarbons in our exclusive economic zone will benefit Europe, its economy, and by extension, its international standing. Therefore, we look forward to cooperating uh, closely with our European partners and linking them to our partners in our immediate neighborhood and possibly beyond in establishing greater energy security and by extension, broader economic security and stability. The second development is that we have managed to cobble together a series of bilateral agreements delineating our exclusive economic zones with our neighbors based on the median line principle and in accordance with the provisions of the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which Cyprus ratified in 1988. These agreements have introduced, in my opinion, a new stabilizing dimension to the politics of the region. Starting with Egypt, we signed uh, such an agreement in 2003, followed by the agreement with Lebanon in 2007 and with Israel in 2010. I would like to note uh, that uh, the fact that Israel is not a signatory to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea did uh, not prevent it from agreeing to the principles of the UN Convention or its articles when it came to signing an agreement with us. This goes to highlight the point I'm, I'm trying to make, that it is possible to reach agreement and establish common ground and that Cyprus is recognized by most of its neighbors as a reliable interlocutor and partner. Of course, uh, one would argue that the benefits are great and that is the reason for adhering to the rules of the convention, which, uh, by the way, uh, it is considered as customary law and as a result, all member states of the United Nations have an obligation to respect it. Be that as it may, the fact remains that in the turbulent Middle East, uh, where tension and conflict uh, remains an intractable problem, there is room for negotiation, dialogue, and cooperation within commonly agreed principles and parameters of international law. I will go further and offer two more examples. The first is Egypt, and uh, the other one is Lebanon. In the first case, in the middle of great uh, transition and uh, instability, the Egyptian government has reaffirmed its commitment to the agreement it has made uh, with the Republic of Cyprus on uh, the delimitation of our exclusive economic zones and has agreed uh, to proceed with talks on the joint exploitation agreement, an accord which would allow us to work uh, together on hydrocarbon fields that fall across our respective exclusive economic zones. This reflects both the importance uh, which the Egyptians attribute to the developments in the offshore drilling, but also their commitment to agreements and to international law. The other is Lebanon, which recently raised a number of technical issues with us over the specific coordinates in our exclusive economic uh, line. What is significant about the way the matter is being handled is that both sides, Cyprus and Lebanon, have met to discuss and to iron out any differences in line with parameters set out by international law on the one hand, but also good neighborly relations. Both Lebanon and Cyprus believe in a win-win situation. As such, 
We believe that uh, with compromise and dialogue, we will achieve more than with confrontation or polemics. In short, uh, we believe that a Cyprus, which is a member state of the European Union, a responsible actor within the international system, and uh, which has good and constructive relations with its neighbors, can serve as a catalyst for cooperation on the regional level and also offers the necessary platform for greater peace, stability, and uh, prosperity in the Eastern Mediterranean. Finally, I would like uh, to talk about Turkey, its attitude and behavior towards uh, Cyprus, its role in the talks between the Greek and Turkish uh, Cypriot communities, and uh, its EU prospects and uh, broader effects on our region. It is with great disappointment that we have come to witness a new hostile phase of Turkey during the past six months. The start of exploratory drilling in the Cypriot EEZ, something which has been planned long in advance and which was not a secret, sparked a tirade of anger on the part of uh, Turkish leaders at the highest levels. I would like to reiterate uh, what I have said earlier, that the decisions and actions of the Republic of Cyprus to explore and exploit its natural resources within its EEZ is entirely legal, falling within its sovereign rights as recognized by the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea of which Cyprus is a state party, and uh, as acknowledged by all our partners in the European Union and uh, by most uh, member states of the United Nations, including all permanent and non-permanent members of the UN Security Council. Then came the blatant threats of violence and uh, saber rattling, which involved uh, Turkish warships and uh, aircraft air and naval exercises in the sea south of Cyprus, an illegal seismic surveying and uh, seabed mapping carried out by ships on behalf of Turkey inside our exclusive economic zone in blatant violation of Cypriot sovereign rights. The next step was uh, the signing by Turkey of an agreement with its proxy in the occupied part of Cyprus, an agreement which seeks to create the semblance of legality in what cannot possibly be legal. I do not need to remind you that the Security Council in 1983 and 1984 resolutions rejected the unilateral declaration of a so-called independent state in the occupied part of Cyprus and uh, instructed the international community not to recognize, not to cooperate, and not to support in any way the secessionist entity. Turkey, being uh, the only country member of the UN that has recognized this illegal entity, continues to violate international law to this day in this respect. But Turkey does not stop here. Its newfound confidence based on real or imagined successes, its economic growth, and I'm sorry to say, the unbridled support it receives in some countries has given rise to a neighborhood bully. A Turkey whose foreign minister promoted a policy of zero problems with its neighbors is now asserting a policy of only problems. The tensions with Israel were just the beginning of uh, a concerted effort by Ankara to delegitimize others in order to legitimize its actions. For example, Mr. Erdogan sees no contradiction in uh, pontificating from the UN General Assembly podium on the failure of uh, Israel to abide by UN resolutions while Turkey is in violation of numerous mandatory UN Security Council resolutions with regard to Cyprus. 
In the case of Cyprus and its exclusive economic zone, Turkey is arguing first that islands have no continental shelf or the right for an exclusive economic zone, and then that its actions are meant to safeguard the right of Turkish Cypriots. Unfortunately, the bottom line is that Turkey cares very little about the Turkish Cypriots and a great deal about its own selfish interests. It is even making claims of an imagined exclusive economic zone of its own, which uh, in some places borders on the exclusive economic zone of Egypt. It would be no exaggeration to say that Turkey is not just uh, violating international law, it is uh, following a conduct in international relations which uh, belongs to another century, before international law was put in place to guide relations between states. My intention is by no means uh, to use this forum for Turkey bashing. My intention is to highlight our full disappointment with Turkey and its leadership. When we decided to seek and work towards accession to the European Union in the late 1990s, our aim was to create conditions on the island which uh, would be seen by the Turkish Cypriots as an expression of our genuine desire to reunify our country in a democratic, peaceful, prosperous state which respects the other and safeguards the individual. Our support for Turkey's European aspirations was equally driven by the belief that a Turkey which is harmonized by, uh, with European rules and with norms which respects human rights and is democratic, a transformed Turkey can only benefit Cyprus. We are, after all, bound to live in this very close geographical proximity from each other forever. We are therefore deeply disappointed when we see Turkey failing to progress along its European path. We are disturbed to see Turkey foiling stubbornly its own accession process. The negotiation process is not progressing. In fact, it has remained frozen because Turkey is failing to meet the European standards and its commitments to the European Union. It is failing because, like in international law, Turkey wants to dictate its own terms to the European Union. The statements by its leadership have left uh, no question that they believe that Turkey needs, that Europe needs Turkey at any cost. That Europe without Turkey is a miserable Europe, as President Abdullah Gül recently said in London. We are hopeful that Turkey, which aspires to be recognized as a regional, if not a global leader, will rise to the occasion. We are hopeful that the Turkish leadership will put aside polemics, diatribes, threats, and adopt a more mild and statesmanlike tone and attitude. We believe that there is room for Turkey to cooperate with its neighbors out of genuine desire towards common ground and mutual benefit. To do that, Turkey must meet its obligations vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. It must meet its obligations in terms of international law. Finally, let me conclude by saying a few words about the long-standing Cyprus problem, which uh, has produced so much suffering to the people of Cyprus as a whole. A Cyprus settlement for the reunification of Cyprus, its people, its economy, and uh, its society that have remained uh, forcibly divided since the Turkish invasion of 1974 and the subsequent occupation 
of 37 percent of its uh, territory has eluded us for 37 years. I shall not go into any detail on the exact form of such a settlement except to reiterate the framework that has uh, already been endorsed uh, by the United Nations. And I'm sure all you're all familiar of uh, this particular paragraph. And it goes as follows. A Cyprus settlement must be based on a state of Cyprus with a single sovereignty and international personality and a single citizenship with its independence and territorial integrity safeguarded and comprising two politically equal communities as defined in the relevant Security Council resolutions in a bizonal, bicommunal federation and that such a settlement must exclude union in whole or in part with any country or any form of partition of secession. <coughs> Definitely this is a very general framework. There are many pieces that have to be put together and agreed upon in order to reach a workable, comprehensive settlement. Such a settlement should encompass all legal and other instruments and other agreements required to arrive at a functioning federation, which would guarantee a secure, peaceful, and prosperous environment for all the people of Cyprus, of all creeds, ethnic backgrounds, and language groups. What is needed is political will to engage in a productive and substantive negotiation that would identify the required elements on all core issues and put them together as part of a fair and final and viable uh, federal solution. Although a new effort has started already more than three years ago and more than 125 direct meetings have taken place so far between the two leaders under the auspices of the UN Secretary General, we are still not near making any substantive progress on the most crucial issues of the executive powers in the governance chapter, as well as in the refugees, property, territory, and uh, citizenship chapters. The main stumbling block has all along been the position maintained by the Turkish Cypriot side, fully supported by the Turkish government, that the goal should not be a federation in the form of one unbreakable federal state with a single sovereignty, single international personality, and single citizenship, as has been agreed and endorsed by the international community, but a confederal arrangement between two separate states with separate sovereignties. This position, <coughs> unfortunately, is still maintained by the Turkish side, and it is manifested in the nature and content of the proposal submitted on uh, a large number of core issues, with the full encouragement, support, and indeed guidance of the entire leadership of the Turkish Republic at both the political and the military level. Despite the difficulties and obstacles on the way, we continue to persist in our efforts to reunify our country in the form of a bizonal bicommunal federation. We shall continue to spare no effort towards the direction of Cyprus's reunification because we strongly hold that such a development would be a win-win situation for all parties concerned, primarily Cyprus and the Cypriots, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots, for Greece and Turkey, and uh, for the European Union and the international community at large. We are determined to make this vision, however difficult and elusive it seems right now, a reality. We owe its fulfillment to our children and uh, to the future generations of Cypriots.
but primarily we owe it to our country, which must survive as a single international personality, a peaceful, democratic, and prosperous place for all its citizens, Greek, Turkish, Armenian, Maronite, and Latin Cypriots, and as an integral part of the European Union. Especially taking into account the developments from the hydrocarbon discoveries in Cyprus's exclusive economic zone, the prospects for prosperity for all Cypriots once reunification is achieved appear tremendous and should work as a catalyst in the direction of moving forward the talks towards reaching an agreement. We sincerely hope that Turkey, which could significantly benefit from a likely cooperation with a reunited Cyprus in all sectors, but primarily in the energy field, will grasp the message of peace, stability, and prosperity inherent in this new development and rise to the required level of leadership, responsibility, and wisdom. Even at a much broader scale, the whole area of the Eastern Mediterranean has the potential of developing into a success story, into a win-win situation for the benefit of peace, stability, and prosperity of the countries of the region and their respective peoples. Let me conclude by a quotation from a speech of former U.S. Senator and uh, Majority Leader at the time and architect of the Northern Ireland Peace Agreement, George J. Mitchell, whom I truly admired for his diplomatic skills, but also for his vision. And he said the following, there is no such thing as a conflict that cannot be ended. They are created by human beings and sustained by human beings. They can be ended by human beings. No matter how ancient the conflict, no matter how much harm <coughs> has been done, peace can prevail. I fully subscribe to such words of wisdom. And if this has been proven true in Europe, if this has been proven true in Northern Ireland, it can also be proven true for Cyprus. I am convinced that the majority of the people of Cyprus, <coughs> of every creed, language, and ethnic background, share the vision of ending this unacceptable division that has caused so much pain and anguish for far too long. This is a vision we should spare <coughs> no effort to make a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was very comprehensive, and we should have a copy of that up on the website of the center uh, uh, shortly after we're finished here today and uh, be available to all of you. And thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, for that uh, very comprehensive thing. I just think I should recognize that it's remarkable that we have um, at least three former American ambassadors to the Republic of Cyprus in the audience and at least one former ambassador to, uh, to Greece with us. And uh, I thank all of them for their service and thank you for being here today. Uh, the floor is open for questions. I think we can take uh, several minutes. Yes. Identify yourself, you'll get a um, microphone. Uh, Mustafa Tunç, I'm a Turkish Cypriot from the TRNC representative office in Washington, D.C. Uh, dear Madam, uh, you have made a um, nice presentation of uh, Cyprus, uh, but a little bit with uh, Greek Cypriot perspective, I, I felt a little bit neglected in your presentations, at least in the first part. Uh, my question is, you have mentioned that um, uh, Cyprus's uh, EU accession uh, 
was uh, motivated by the fact that you wanted to unify the country and that it would help to it. But we had this uh, Annan plan and the referendum uh, related to it, and um, the Greek Cypriot people voted no to a unification plan. And um, that was a bit uh, conflicting thing in my mind at that time when I was in Cyprus. And uh, I would like to learn if your government right now encourages its people to vote for a yes for a peace and um, a unification plan this time. Uh, and uh, I want to be hopeful about it. And uh, the second uh, question is that uh, you will be um, having the European Union presidency. Uh, at least it seems like that. And um, so if, I won. If, yeah. If 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 we don't uh, if we cannot find a, a solution again, if you people vote no again, uh, are you going to continue to ignore the Turkish Cypriots? What 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 is the plan of your uh, administration to um, make sure that the disadvantage of the Turkish P Cypriot people um, that will that will uh, come come to the reality will be turned into an advantage in uh, during your uh, presidency? Thank you very much. Shall I take more or shall uh, I? Uh, uh, why I'll don't you do that? Yeah. Take that and we'll have one next Thank one. You, so uh, shall I yeah. sign up? Okay. Thank you very much, Mustafa. Uh, let me first say that uh, I'm really glad that you're here. Uh, and I hope that there are more uh, Turkish Cypriots uh, in this uh, room. Good. Mm. I'm really glad. I hope I will have some time to discuss with you. As I do have time and I make time in Cyprus when I am... Uh, uh, when I am in Cyprus and when I have the opportunity to discuss with our uh, Turkish Cypriot compatriots, um, I have a, a long history of uh, engaging in rapprochement and uh, I believe in uh, the coexistence uh, between the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots. We have no other alternative if we want to save our country. So um, uh, uh, you mentioned the Anand plan. Uh, that was one of the efforts uh, that uh, reached in that particular plan. Uh, what I always say, and I think this, uh, this time I think we are making it uh, the right way, what we are trying uh, all these years is to draft a new constitution. In so simple words, we are trying to draft a new constitution for our country, a constitution that will change the present unitary state to a federal state. So as in every constitution, I mean, we, we are here in the United States, who drafted the constitution of, uh, of the United States? The people. So it has to be the result of the people's engagement through their leaders, not any outside interference and the disadvantage to say the least of the Anand plan, was that it was drafted by others. And that is why it was seen by the majority of the Greek Cypriots as an imposed solution. So that's gone. Our political will to reunify our country not only remains, but it has become stronger. And this time around, uh, when uh, the new negotiation started, we made sure that the process of negotiations is Cypriot-owned, and it remains Cypriot-owned. And this is how it should be, because this is a constitution we are drafting among ourselves between the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots that will transform our country into a federal country. So. Yes, we are committed to a federation. We are committed to saying yes to, an, to a plan that will be agreed between the leaders of the two communities. And this is our objective. Uh, hopefully, we will reach that point. We have not yet. But uh, when we reach that point that there will be an agreed plan, an agreed solution, uh, then, of course, we will encourage uh, our respective communities to support it. Thank um. you. Christina, yeah, fifth person in. Mr. Manitou. 
I'm Mike Manitas, and we represent here in Washington um, the top national Cypriot American community uh, organizations and several national Greek American organizations. Madam Minister, thank you for your remarks, and, and welcome back to Washington. We've, we've missed you. Uh, your, your visit is very well timed. As, as you know, uh, recently, um, one in four members of Congress and one in four United States senators uh, signed a letter to President Obama expressing concern about the U.S. policy towards the Republic of Cyprus and Cyprus settlement efforts. In your meeting with Secretary Clinton this morning and your meetings yesterday with key members of Congress, like the chairman and ranking member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, have you picked up any reconsideration or adjustment of the U.S. policy towards Cyprus and settlement efforts? You don't expect me to say anything about what uh, uh, transpired during my meeting with Secretary Clinton. It was a very good meeting. I think we had uh, an opportunity to discuss the, um, uh, the current stage of the negotiations. Uh, I had an opportunity to explain in detail what are the difficulties uh, involved uh, uh, in the negotiations at, at this particular point in time and how the United States uh, could help in the direction of, uh, of reaching a solution. Uh, we had also the uh, opportunity to discuss our cooperation in the energy uh, sector and, uh, of course, this uh, exciting new development of, uh, of the um, current um, uh, survey, but also the uh, possible exploitation of uh, natural gas in our exclusive economic zone and uh, the prospects uh, for peace and stability and prosperity for the whole region through our cooperation with Israel, but also through our cooperation with um, a number of other countries in the region, particularly Egypt and Lebanon. Um, on the part of the Secretary um, of State, uh, uh, there was a very strong reaffirmation of the support of the United States government to the sovereign rights of the Republic of Cyprus. And for, um, for me, it was um, an occasion to express our deep appreciation for uh, this principal position of the United States in this particular field. But um, I'm sorry, Mustafa, I did not uh, reply to your question about uh, the EU presidency. <laughs> All right, you see, I didn't uh, forget it. Um, as you very well know, despite the threats and despite the, um, uh, the objections of, uh, uh, of uh, the government in Turkey, uh, of course, Cyprus will be presiding over the uh, uh, European uh, Council uh, in the second part of 2012. This is uh, an obligation, but this is a right also of every single member state of, uh, of the European Union, so we are very proud, and we think that uh, this is a very historic occasion for Cyprus uh, to uh, preside over the, European, uh, of, of the Council of the European Union. Now, hopefully, we'll have a solution by that time, but if not, Cyprus will uh, assume the role of the presidency. And of course, uh, during our presidency, we will be promoting European issues. We are not going to promote the Cyprus problem, uh, so you can rest assured that this is not a forum and this is not an opportunity for promoting the Cyprus problem. Uh, there are um, hundreds uh, of uh, European issues uh, that uh, preoccupy the European Union right now. Uh, first and foremost is the economic crisis uh, and uh, the efforts of the European Union uh, to put together a, a pact, uh, an agreement between uh, the Eurozone and a number of other countries uh, to uh, make sure that we go through these difficulties uh, in the best possible way. So uh, uh, I think that we are going to do well, uh, hopefully uh, as a reunited country, but if not, then we will uh, assume our responsibility as we ought to. Thank you. Hello, Catherine Porter. Hi, Catherine. How are you? Fine. Welcome back. Thank you. I can't uh, resist the opportunity to ask you about the antiquities of Cyprus, which are really a gift to all the world. And if there is any more progress in terms of preserving them <coughs> and to limiting the amount of looting that goes on, and, and if you could touch also on, on the... Um, Christian sites that exist in Cyprus and if they are being um, destroyed or looted or preserved. We're hoping for progress. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Catherine. Um, I think this is one of the saddest uh, stories of uh, all the saddest uh, aspects uh, of, uh, of the Cyprus uh, problem, apart from the missing and, uh, and the other humanitarian issues. Because what has been going on uh, during these past 37 years uh, is uh, a complete uh, looting and uh, uh, destruction of uh, the entire Christian, but also ancient Greek cultural heritage of Cyprus. Over 500 churches have been looted. Uh, you just have to cross uh, the uh, checkpoint and go to the uh, northern part and uh, see uh, with your own eyes uh, the situation of our churches, uh, completely stripped from all their belongings, from all the icons, from the frescoes, we have here, uh, we had here in the United States two uh, well-known cases, uh, the Kanakaria mosaics uh, dating back to the 6th century AD uh, that finally because of uh, uh, the um, uh, importance of uh, the judicial system here in the United States, we were able to um, have them uh, return back to, uh, to Cyprus. And again, we have another uh, case uh, of the Agios Temonianos uh, frescoes, uh, which uh, were purchased by the Demenil Foundation. Uh, they were restored uh, and they were kept, uh, uh, as you know, in a chapel that was built for this purpose. And now, in the next few months, uh, after following an agreement uh, with the Church of Cyprus, these uh, frescoes uh, will return back uh, to, uh, to Cyprus. So these are the two uh, success stories, but there are 60,000 icons uh, and there are many, many other archeological objects that have been looted. We don't know where they are. Some of them, they're in the hands of uh, um, uh, antique dealers uh, in Europe or in the United States. So we are trying uh, to uh, locate them through uh, the auctions, the different auctions that are taking place around the world. and. In many cases, we are purchasing back our own treasures. Uh, so this is very sad. Um, I'm sure that uh, this was uh, not the fault of our Turkish Cypriot compatriots. That was a policy pursued by the occupying power, by Ankara, uh, to eliminate uh, the, uh, the presence of any Christian or any Greek Cypriot or, or any Greek, ancient Greek uh, presence. Uh, in the northern part, in the occupied part of Cyprus. Uh, it is deplorable, uh, it is uh, condemnable, and um, uh, uh, what can I say? It belongs, uh, all these treasures belong to the uh, world cultural heritage, and I think there is a responsibility on the part of uh, all humanity, all countries around the world, to help us in tracing back our treasures. Yeah, yeah. Somebody else wants a question. You can carry on. If you know, <laughs> if Mustafa knows where they are, I would be very. Uh -huh. <laughs> he was going to say for you, special price. <laughs> <laughs> okay, quickly. Uh, a couple of questions in the back, if she has time. But go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, uh, sorry, you wanted to follow up. Very quickly. Uh, I believe the uh, preservation of the cultural heritage issue is uh, not only uh, concerned about the Christian heritage, but uh, it's, uh, it has something to do with the uh, Muslim heritage that the Turkish Cypriots uh, owned mm -hmm. uh, in, the, uh, in the South Cyprus. Uh, I have many, uh, I really have many pictures of uh, deserted uh, cemeteries, Turkish ancient Turkish Cypriot cemeteries, and um, uh, damaged mosques, uh, completely uh, deserted mosques and all that. I think we have to cooperate on this rather than just uh, telling each other's uh, own position on it because mm -hmm. uh, if we want to uh, be peaceful with each other, we have to be respectful to each other's religion and cultural heritage. And I am a big supporter of this as a, as a learner of ancient Greek myself. Uh, and uh, please, please... Uh, consider me as a, as a person who, who, who loves to protect all these uh, values. 
and uh, I'm doing my best. Uh, That's what I said. I it's do. not the Turkey Cypriot. Yes. It's somebody else uh, under instructions from above. I mean, uh, it's our common responsibility to protect all the cultural heritage in Diana, not only Christian cultural heritage. And uh, as I observed uh, from the uh, latest <laughs> events that uh, took place in the co recent couple of years, uh, both sides need to be very, um, very sensitive about the uh, religious uh, side of the coin. Um, it's it's same for uh, the Turkish Cypriots and the Greek Cypriots as well. Uh, I I know that Greek Cypriots uh, experienced some uh, some difficult moments in the past because of some procedural uh, misunderstandings on this and that. And Turkish Cypriots had the same. We cannot uh, have access to the Hala Sultan Tekke uh, outside the public hours, and that's a, that's a little bit of shame. And uh, I think it's a two-sided coin, and we have to be uh, very sensitive on these issues uh, together. And uh, it will just contribute to the peace and uh, mutual understanding of the people and nothing else. Uh, there are two final questions, if you can take them. Sure. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon, Madam Minister. Good to see you Hello, again. Hello, Mr. Larengakis. Nick Larengakis with the American Hellenic Institute. As we uh, sit here in this fine auditorium here in the closing days of 2011, 37 and a half years later, what we have on the facts on the surface are a NATO ally with its troops occupying a member of the European Union, that of Cyprus. You mentioned, of course, of the provocative action and the saber rattling of this entity of, of Turkey as, as the uh, uh, exploration and drilling continues to go in Block 12 and potentially in other areas around the other 11 or 12 blocks in the economic exclusive zone of Cyprus. How worried are you, Madam Minister, that Turkey uh, could escalate in its provocative actions in the future? And if they do, really, at the end of the day, what recourse does the country of Cyprus have uh, in trying to engage in any uh, actions that, that involve your economic exclusive zone? Let's take the uh, uh, second, the, the last question, and you can answer both. Thank you, Honorable Minister. It's a pleasure to see you back in Washington on Alfred Ferguson conducting research on peace building in Cyprus. Isn't there a contradiction between unification and the bizonal, bicommunal state? Isn't the federation a form of partition? Why cannot the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots live anywhere they like in Cyprus? As European citizens, they can move around in Europe. Why cannot they move around within the island? Thank you. Ah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I think we have to face uh, the realities. Uh, we had uh, an invasion, we had uh, an occupation, uh, and we had a forcible division of our country and of our people in 1974. Now, our leaders, uh, and especially on our side, uh, Archbishop Magarius, at the time, uh, he was uh, wise enough uh, to um, uh, come to the conclusion that the only way for Cyprus to be reunited was through a federal system, through a federal ar arrangement. And I'm saying wise because uh, I have come to the conclusion myself to believe very strongly that the only way we can reunite our country. We can uh, ensure the permanent stability in our country is through a federal system. We have 25 different federal systems uh, uh, around the world. In one of them, you live here in the United States. There are 24 other different federal systems. And uh, a federal system uh, is uh, supposed to unite people of uh, a different culture, of a different background, historical background, uh, ethnic background. Uh, uh, so it is a unifying factor. The, uh, the, uh, imagine, for example, India, how it would uh, look like today if it did not have a federal system. They have uh, over 400 languages. Uh, they have, um, I don't know how many religions, and the only system that can put them together is a federal system. But it has to be a true 
and genuine federation. And this is uh, this is why we are arguing so strongly about uh, the um, uh, the elements of a federal system uh, that have to be agreed uh, in Cyprus and not two separate states in a kind of a confederal arrangement. So if uh, we concentrate uh, on a, yes, by zonal, by communal uh, federation, meaning that one part of uh, one uh, constituent state uh, or constituent part will be administered by Turkish Cypriots and the other constituent part uh, will be administered by Greek Cypriots. At the same time, they should have a central government where they will be cooperating, and this is the bicommunal aspect of the federation. So yes, we can do it, uh, and I'm, I'm, strong, I'm a strong believer in, uh, in federation, uh, and uh, I have studied most of the uh, federal systems uh, in the world, uh, but we have to make sure that we are talking about a true federation, and it can happen. We, we have uh, gone 15 minutes over the appointed hour, um, and I know there, uh, your, your question was not answered. Your ah. uh, okay, sorry, sorry, Nick. Um, how worried we are uh, for uh, Turkish uh, threats Thanks. and the escalation. We are very worried. That's why I'm here. That's uh, why I talked to the Secretary of State. That's why I talk to our partners in the European Union. We, make, we want to make sure that uh, messages that uh, uh, are sent to Turkey or go uh, through Turkey are very strong and are very assertive, uh, that this kind of behavior cannot be condoned. Now, what can we do? Of course, we don't have our fleet. We don't have a uh, uh, military force uh, and... Uh, the only recourse we have is uh, international law. So uh, we are preparing, uh, and I can assure you that uh, we have uh, the top international lawyers uh, to advise us uh, how to proceed in case that Turkey um, engages in, uh, let's say, more uh, illegal activities uh, in the area. Let's all give uh, Dr. Kazuku Markoulis a round of applause. Thank you very much for being here. You all are welcome at the Woodrow Wilson Center anytime. Thank you for coming. Have a good holiday.